Right, well, I think we'll get started. I'm sure other people will be joining us during the session. So welcome to the second of three warm-up webinars that we're hosting uh, in preparation for our next and third Meet the Russell Group uh, virtual fair running on the 29th of September, which is next Wednesday. Today, we've got eight universities from the Russell Group, as well as a special guest um, who will be running through a number of questions that we've pre-prepared, and then we'll be answering some of the questions that you're supplying at you through the session. So if you've got questions running throughout the whole of this, make sure that you're popping it in the Q&A. Um, and we'll make sure that we get around to it. If you've got any questions specifically for one of the exhibitors, if you just make it fairly clear in the Q&A exactly who you're looking to put that towards, uh, hopefully that person will be able to reply to you. So who have we got of us uh, today? We've got Catherine from the University of Birmingham. We've got Rona from the University of Glasgow. We've got Glenn from the University of Bristol. Katie from the University of Manchester. We've got Richard from University of Oxford. We've got Gail from the University of Southampton. We've got Sarah from the University of Warwick, and finally Emma from the University of York. I mentioned about a, a special guest that we've got with us today, and that is in fact actually Dr. Tim Bradshaw, who's the Chief Executive of the Russell Group. And actually Tim is the first person that we're going to be speaking to today. So uh, our kind of introduction, I guess, really is, is great coming from Tim. Um, and what I wanted to ask him is, kind of before we get into detail of Russell Group Universities, is if you can give us a bit of an introduction as to what the Russell Group is, its mission, what its aims are, um, give us a bit more information about how the Russell Group at universities work together, um, and just give us a general overview, Tim, if that's okay. Great, yes, thank you. Um, and, and welcome everybody to um, this afternoon's webinar. Really pleased that you can join us today. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm the Chief Executive of the Russell Group. And, and what is the Russell Group? Well, it's a, a group that brings together the 24 uh, best sort of research intensive universities in the UK. Uh, they're they're world-class universities, um, all with a unique um, style and, and history, but all with a very uh, similar ethos. In fact, a shared ethos, and that's around excellence. And that's excellence in pretty much everything that we do. So really, really high quality teaching uh, for students at undergraduate and a postgraduate level. World-class research that spans the full breadth of, of research from arts and humanities and social sciences into science, technology, engineering and maths. And you, you'll have seen some of that research uh, being used uh, really quite sort of uh, dr dramatically across the planet in, uh, recently with the, the COVID pandemic. We've seen AstraZeneca, uh, Oxford joining together to create vaccines. Many of our other universities have helped to develop other treatments and things that are being used globally. So this is, these are really, really fantastic institutions playing on the global stage in terms of their, their research capabilities. Um, but for you as students, uh, and, and, and for those of you who are representing um, students who might be coming to our universities, what, what will you see if you come to, our, to, to one of our 24? Well, I think you'll see, uh, as I said, excellent teaching, really high quality lecturers, really engaged um, teachers who want to uh, get the best out of students. I think you'll find most fantastic facilities. So if you're doing um, lab subjects, um, chemistry, physics, all those sorts of things, and some of the best facilities in the UK that you can that you can access for teaching. And if you're doing arts or humanities, social science type subjects, then we've also home to many uh, superb galleries and collections that students will have access to. And I think students will be able to join in with research in many of the subjects that they're studying as well. So huge opportunity uh, for people who come and study with us. Uh, and if you're into sport and things like that, then, and then also fantastic opportunity to, to do that. I know that um, Birmingham is one of the co-hosts for the uh, Commonwealth Games next year and has superb facilities that they have available for students to use as well. And that's the same across all of our group. Um, brilliant place if you want to do those sorts of things. Uh, I mean, if I wanted to just sort of sum up one thing about the Russell Group and to sort of tell you, um, give you a sort of impression of where, where we sit, I, I try and ex explain to people that you know, actually the UK is incredibly, incredibly lucky to have these universities. Ultimately, they are some of the best universities on the planet. They are world renowned for their teaching, they're world renowned for their research expertise. And I think that shows in the, the sort of students that we get to come to our universities. So actually around about a third of the students we have are from overseas, uh, bringing a real sort of cultural mix and international dimension 
into that sort of teaching and learning space. And within the UK um, itself, you know, we are responsible for educating something like four out of five of all of the doctors and dentists that are trained in the UK. Um, over a third of all of the engineers that have come out of UK universities come from Russell Group universities, and it's about half of the physical sciences um, and mathematics graduates as well. So a really diverse population of interesting disciplines, really diverse group of interesting universities all within the group. And as I say, with that shared ethos of excellence, these really are the best universities you can go to in the UK, and I would say the best universities on the planet as well. So perhaps I'll, I'll stop there and then hand over to my, uh, my co-presenters who will tell you a little bit more about actually what it's like at an individual institution. That's great, Tim. Thank you so much for getting us started for the webinar. And yes, I'll be passing on to our next university, uh, which is Catherine at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Catherine, the question for you is, what is the Russell Group? What makes Russell Group University different to other universities? Okay, um, well, thank you uh, very much for the introduction. Um, I think you've heard a bit about um, what the uh, Russell Group is, a collection of, of uh, research in intensive universities that are known for their uh, quality of research and teaching. And I wanted to kind of have a look at what that actually means really for you um, as students deciding on where to go to university. What does, what does that focus on research and teaching excellence actually do? Well, it actually puts Russell Group universities towards the top of the university league tables. That academic achievement means that we have a good reputation and therefore our entry requirements do tend to be higher than non-Russell Group universities. But also, even as Russell Group universities, we set our own entry requirements and you can find differences in entry requirements for the same subject at different Russell Group um, universities. As you've heard, we do focus on more research than at other universities, and it is worth thinking, well, why is that important and how is that going to affect me? Well, it does matter to, to the whole of society because Russell Group universities are finding solutions to, you know, real life, national, global, um, economic, social, scientific, cultural problems. You've heard about the research we've been doing around COVID, but other, each of us will have areas of research that we, uh, we focus on. You've heard that we do sport at Birmingham and into the Commonwealth Games, hosting them for Birmingham next year. So um, we have a lot of research around that, things like developing um, pitch side tests to detect concussion in sports people, developing sports nutrition, um, developing sporting equipment. But we do non-sporty research as well, finding cures for cancer and other illnesses, trying to slow down climate change. And like I say, different universities will have different subjects really that they specialize in. But also by doing this research, Russell Group universities attract world-renowned academics and researchers to work at them. And how does that benefit you? Well, as a student, you get taught by those experts. You learn from their cutting edge research. They'll pass on their knowledge and their expertise to you. And you can get involved sometimes in that research as well by helping gathering and analyzing data, perhaps in your final year dissertation project, or maybe as a summer job um, during those uh, long uh, university vacations. But also this research brings money into the universities. And as you've heard, uh, about three quarters of all university research grants um, from government and charity organisations go to Russell Group universities. And that means that we can invest in our facilities and so can have uh, better facilities sometimes than non-Russell Group universities. And you'll hear more about university facilities from another speaker in, in, in a little while. Um, but also it means that employers will target students at Russell Group universities because they know that they're getting a quality education and they're producing uh, top uh, graduates, you know, who are who've got all sorts of, of, of up to date knowledge and skills, making them highly employable. So there are many um, uh, uh, companies 
that will specifically target Russell Group universities for their, their students. They will go to the big graduate recruitment fairs at those universities. They'll run special events, um, you know, like networking sessions or information sessions. They'll offer internships, paid summer work experience um, opportunities. And then that gives you the real edge when you're applying for jobs for when you finish at university. You know, they'll give you tips um, to help improve your application um, and they're very much uh, wanting to you to go and um, uh, to, to work for them but also um, you know there are some jobs as well that are well known for favouring uh, students from uh, um, Russell Group universities you know um, often those investment banking companies um, those legal companies uh, barristers uh, civil service um, can often um, be very interested in, in, in recruiting students from Russell Group um, universities. So I think those are some of the main um, benefits to you for coming to a Russell Group university. And as I say, some of my colleagues are going to pick up on some of those things. But I'd still say the most important thing is that you choose the right course at the right place for you, wherever that may be. So I think Martin's going to come back and introduce the next uh, speaker. That's great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yes, I am. And our next speaker is Rona from the University of Glasgow. Rona, what characterises the teaching and the learning experience at Russell Group Universities? Great. Thanks, Martin. OK, so we've heard a little bit about the research excellence um, and research intensive universities that, that they form the Russell Group. But what does this really mean if you're thinking of studying an undergraduate degree? How will this inform your degree? Um, so our staff, our academics, our scientists um, are undertaking research that is improving the world right now. The research that they're doing informs our undergraduate teaching. So we're using the research that is going on in the world at the moment to shape a new generation of academics um, and, and researchers and thinkers. Um, Tim's already mentioned some of the fantastic work that is going into the COVID research. I'm just going to give you, give you some more. Um, just to be topical at the moment. Um, so this just kind of demonstrates how Russell Group universities work together. So while we are separate institutions, we can come together and collaborate on really big research projects. So we have members of staff from Birmingham, Cambridge, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Exeter, Glasgow, Liverpool, UCL, Imperial, Nottingham, Oxford, Sheffield, um, at least um, are part of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, which analyzes the virus. So lots and lots of collaborative work going on there. Glasgow is one of the three new leading test centres, um, delivering thousands of tests a day for COVID. And some researchers from Durham are working with dogs um, that can actually detect the virus, um, people carrying the virus. This is just a snapshot of activity that's happening across the Russell Group, a very, very small snapshot. But what's fantastic about going to university where all this activity is going on is that it informs our undergraduate programmes. So if you think of the university as a sort of like an ecosystem, so what happens at the top informs what's happening at the bottom. So as an undergraduate student and you as a postgraduate student, you have access to all these fantastic academics and thinkers and you will be getting taught by people at the forefront um, of all these amazing discoveries. Um, this is just, not just in the sciences, but in our arts and social sciences as well. So we've heard that the Russell Group has a fantastic diverse range of subjects. And this is true if you're thinking of any type of degree at a Russell Group University, you'll have all this fantastic um, experience, all these fantastic academics um, at, your, at your fingertips. Um, that you can, you can contact and it will inform your undergraduate programme. As well as having access to all these fantastic academics, um, we have some of the best teaching facilities um, in the UK. So online learning, um, uh, online learning tools um, have been developed um, leaps and bounds over the last 18 months. Um, and I'm sure there'll be questions about um, online learning um, as we go on. I um, but there's really some fantastic systems ready to support our student learners. Russell Group always um, invests a lot of money in our teaching facilities. So we have um, fantastic lecture halls, labs, um, upgraded study spaces. 
um, at Glasgow, I can just give you an example because that's where, where I'm uh, from. Um, we have a new building right on campus, um, which has um, huge big lecture theatres and lots of study space for students. Um, and I'm sure anybody today will be happy to answer questions on your teaching facilities. But across the board for the Russell Group, um, really kind of top tier uh, fantastic facilities. Not just about the teaching facilities and the research as well. Um, if you're thinking of going to a Russell Group University, um, the social side of things is also very important. Um, our universities here today will have a range of different clubs and societies. Um, each university will have probably in the region of hundreds of clubs and societies from all sorts of um, all sorts of things from subject specific to food and drinks clubs to um, film clubs absolutely anything you can look for you'll be able to find um, most likely at one of our universities um, and again we're happy to answer questions in this on the in the chat as we go on um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now thanks Martin that's great thanks a lot Rona our next question then is for Glenn at the University of Bristol Glenn while Russell Group University oh. Oh, I, <laughs> whilst Russell Group University share characteristics, what advice would you give to students trying to choose between them? It's a really great question. And um, we are going to hear a lot about um, the benefits and, and they are many. <laughs> um, but one of the things that, that most people really find um, under normal circumstances when you can go and visit um, a university is that that feeling you get for the place and I think it, Rona mentioned how universities have been very quick and very able and agile in adapting to online learning and I genuinely think there's masses of advantages for people in conducting their research into universities um, from things like um, the open week so um, open events have mainly still been virtual um, we would love to welcome you to our campus most of the academics and the student workers as well as folk like me who work in the offices trying to help get the word out um, like nothing better than the open events but there is a distinct advantage to um, the switch to these being virtual in that you are in a position um, as I said many have happened uh, across the Russell Group already through the last few weeks and um, there will be more coming up over the next few weeks but you have the position of going to loads whereas under normal circumstances you can only you know afford the time and indeed the money to attend um, a, a small number of open events so um, going to get going to the place meeting academics meeting current students getting a feel for it is is one of the most important things and I, I realize if you're in year 13 uh, you haven't had the chance to do that, um, but I would reassure you that actually once you've put in your UCAS application and you've done your research so you get inundated with offers, most universities will then invite you to an offer holder event and we're all hoping and praying that these will take place on our campuses um, next year um, and, and even earlier in some cases. So that's a great opportunity to go and get that, that feel for the place. For year 12, we hope that you'll also get the chance to do that in the round of June open days um, but between now and when you can visit the campus um, the research that you can do into figuring out not only what course is right for you and I, you might still be choosing between you know subjects the process of getting a good idea about what that subject actually looks like at university what that study is going to involve how you're going to spend your time day in day out what you're going to be doing how much of it will be in labs how much of it will be in seminars that research to get a really good idea about what a course at university looks like because it can be quite different from school that research is not only going to help you choose and get a good sense about the right course and the university, it's also um, going to do you loads of good for those personal statements. And when you get to interview, because we are selective, because we have, um, we tend to have more applicants than we have places, we want to make sure that those places go to someone who's not only going to um, cope, but is going to thrive and love their studies. So I would say choosing between the Russell Group Universities now um, is probably best done by digging a bit deeper into what those courses look like and most of the um, course pages you can find on all the 24 universities will, will link to a place where you can find out a lot of detail about each of the the options you might have so, 
probably be fewer options in the first year, more in second and third year and so on. And these will tell you a bit more about what you'll cover, who you'll be taught by. And that can also be a really great way to get excited and distinguish between them. Um, there's also other things you can start to research. And we're going to hear a lot more um, this evening about things like the difference in facilities. They, we have amazing facilities, has been mentioned, but they will vary from one university to the other. And there'll also be um, difference between courses that will give you opportunities to travel um, up, up to and including a year or sometimes just for um, a teaching term or two. Um, some universities have greater and um, more exciting and perhaps more relevant to you opportunities to get work experience and summer placements and internships. So I would say start with the course and start to get a really clear sense. Am I looking at studying the right thing, the thing that I'm gonna really love, and then go a bit further and start to choose between those universities so that hopefully you can draw up a little short list and come and see us all next summer. And we can't wait to be uh, <laughs> welcoming you to our campus in person again, but um, it's very lovely to speak to you this evening. Thank you for that, Martin. That's great. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Right, we're moving on to Katie at the University of Manchester. Uh, Katie, how accessible are Russell Group universities and what type of pre-university support is available? Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, so as, as Martin says, I'm Katie from the University of Manchester. And just to, to start us off with this question, I would like to say that having events like this and, and all of us coming together and speaking to you about the opportunities at Russell Group Universities are one of the ways that we want to make sure we are accessible and that students can find out about us, that students can understand what we have to offer, uh, how you can apply to us uh, and whether or not coming to a Russell Group University is the right choice for you. So us hosting open days, uh, delivering presentations, uh, whether they be virtual or in your school or college, uh, talking to you about applying to university, and also, I know we're all hosting uh, webinars, we're, we're delivering webinars and we can access those on, on university websites, advising uh, students on, on kind of what we look for in applications and how to make a good application to, to a Russell Group University. So as it's already been alluded to, uh, entry requirements are very competitive at, at Russell Group Universities. Um, and it's important to, to remember that irrespective of entry requirements, uh, we want to attract the best students uh, and we want students to succeed when they come and start their course with us. So we want to attract the best students irrespective of, of social or, or educational background. So I just first of all wanted to, to say a little bit about contextual admissions uh, with respect to how we are making sure that we are accessible. So all Russell Group universities uh, have contextual admissions policies, and you can have a look at each of our websites, have a search on contextual data, contextual admissions, to see what those policies are. I'll tell you a little bit about how we do things at Manchester. Um, so because we want to ensure that the student body is representative uh, of the diversity of talent in our communities, we recognise that some applicants may have previously faced social or socioeconomic or educational disadvantages. And the use of contextual information it gives our admissions, admissions tutors sorry, a fuller understanding of an applicant's potential to succeed. So put simply, contextual data is, is additional information that universities consider uh, when making decisions on applications alongside the information in your UCAS form. Uh, we don't make decisions solely based on contextual information, but it is a consideration. And with regards to what we are actually looking at in terms of the data. At Manchester, if, you, if your postcode shows that you live in a, a disadvantaged area or an area of low participation in higher education, this means that you get what we call a WP flag uh, and providing you met the standard academic entry, entry criteria for the course you want to apply for, uh, you will get um, additional consideration during any selection process. So when admissions staff are looking at your application, your personal statement at interview, they will bear in mind that you have this WP flag uh, and kind of um, take that into account when assessing your application. If you meet the postcode criteria, plus you attended a school or college that performed below the national average for GCSE or A-level, you get what we call a WP plus flag. Uh, and so if you have a WP plus flag, and again, providing you um, uh, have 
presented a good application, you will receive a contextual offer. Um, so that means that your offer will be one grade lower than the standard entry requirement for that course. And lastly, if you have indicated on your UCAS form that you've been in care for more than three months or have refugee status, your application will automatically receive a WP plus indicator uh, and you will receive a contextual offer of up to two grades below the standard offer. So just wanted to highlight contextual admissions because it's, it's a very uh, important way of Russell Group Universities making sure that we are considering the full picture uh, when we assess uh, applications to the university and do have a look at all of our websites to understand those policies. Secondly, I just wanted to say a little bit about university access schemes uh, because we all have access schemes in place uh, and they are designed to support students in progressing to uh, the universities. It's to help students to prepare. Uh, we have at Manchester our flagship scheme, which is the Manchester Access Programme. That's for local students who meet specific uh, widening participation criteria uh, and providing they complete the programme, which involves completing an academic assignment, attending a series of workshops, uh, basically um, kind of participating in, in a full 12 month programme alongside their, their college studies, which is really manageable, it's kind of designed to complement what students do at college, then you are eligible for a, a grade reduction and a scholarship if you progress to Manchester. We also participate in Pathways to Law, which several of the other Russell Group universities do. And um, this is a, a programme specifically designed to um, help and support students in accessing uh, a law degree at one of the Russell Group universities and helping students to prepare for, for studying on a course like that. So again, having a look at the website, you'll be able to see information about our access schemes and whether or not you would be eligible or not to apply for any of those. Lastly, I wanted to say a bit about finance because all of us have really, you know, competitive and good scholarship and bursary programmes in place to make our institution accessible. So to make sure that students, again, regardless of the income and kind of financial situation, are able to study with us and are able to access some additional financial support if they need to. Uh, we have at Manchester the, the Manchester Bursary that's based on household income uh, and that's a, a set amount of additional funding each year a student studies with us. I think it's about a thousand pounds at the moment per year uh, and that's non-repayable. That's a scholarship for students who are in need of that to help support them with their, their studies. So there's some of the things that we are all doing to make uh, our institutions accessible. Uh, and in terms of kind of the pre-university support, some of the things I mentioned in relation to the access programmes very much do help students to, um, to kind of prepare for university in terms of developing their academic skills, for example. But we have also very targeted support for particular groups. So we have events for students who uh, have a disability to understand what support is available, to speak to our disability advisory service well before they start their course to make sure things are in place and that they can access their course uh, and, and do what they need to do and be well prepared before they start their course. So I guess my main message is uh, that we're very open to, to providing information to anybody who wants it about what it's like to study with us and how we can help support you in your application and what it is we're looking for. Uh, and secondly, we have lots of information on our website about contextual admissions, access schemes and bursaries. I'll stop there and hand back to Martin. That's great. Thanks a lot, Katie. Hopefully everyone can see me okay. I got a message about unstable connection a second ago, but I'll keep plowing on. Uh, next question is for uh, Richard at the University of Oxford. Uh, Richard, is it true that courses in the Russell Group have more of an academic focus? Are there opportunities for students interested in practical or arts-based courses? Thanks very much, Martin. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, pretty wide question. Um, is it true the courses in the Russell Group have more of an academic focus? Well, firstly, to introduce myself, yeah, as Martin said, I'm Richard from Trinity College, Oxford, which is one of the 35 or so colleges that makes up the University of Oxford. Russell Group, all of the 24 universities uh, across the Russell Group are very academic in their focus. I think not much can be said. But in terms of the question asked, do they have more of an academic focus? It's fair to say that lots of the other universities that aren't in the Russell Group also have a pretty academic focus. What I can say about all of the universities in the Russ Group is they do have a very academic focus and you can see that uh, in some of the things that 
our panelists have touched on this evening. So for instance, you can see very clearly across the Russell Group universities and across all universities, the tariff, the um, grades that universities are generally making offers uh, on in terms of A-levels or equivalents. You can see an element of a very academic focus in those, but really importantly as well, is to drill down when you're interested in looking at universities, drill down to the subject level and see what actually the teaching and learning in a given subject involves across a given university, be that in the Russell Group or not. And I'm pretty confident that if you drill down to that level, particular subject at a particular university, you'll see that all the Russell Group universities, including Oxford, have a very academic approach. The way that may be shown, for example, is the um, expectations in terms of workload, how work is delivered and how frequently, and also the teaching and learning styles, be they um, uh, lectures, for example, tutorials, which are very, very small group teaching, uh, seminars at which you're expected to deliver a paper, perhaps on a rotor basis, for example, once a term. So yes, they do have a very academic focus. As we've already said, as Tim focused on as well, Russell Group universities do have a very research-based focus as well. And uh, I'm delighted that Tim stole my thunder on there because in terms of the research focus, which is so important for Russell Group universities, I'll be another person this evening who's going to mention the research that's, that's gone on in terms of finding us a vaccine um, in our work as uh, our university at Oxford with AstraZeneca. Now, are there, are there opportunities for students interested in practical or arts-based courses? I'd want to approach this um, question firstly by saying, this is not uh, an either or to an academic focus. In other words, the courses with a practical uh, focus or courses that are arts-based are of course also extremely academic. Um, and yes, so there are opportunities for students interested in practical or arts-based courses. I'd also like to say that a course can be very academic and also practical. If you think about the courses that are offered across the Russell Group, um, many of the courses have a very close vocational element and association. Typically, for example, if you take the courses of, across the curriculum, engineering, um, law or medicine, all of those would be associated in our minds and also the minds of graduate recruiters with particular vocations, with particular professions, with particular careers. And then, as is also common across the Russell Group, we have a significant provision of arts-based courses, which are also very academic and also are often linked to vocational outcomes, in other words, particular careers or professions. And um, so an example of those for my own institution, arts-based courses, well, certainly something like fine art or history of art or music would all be considered arts-based courses. And we're very proud of the role that they play in our overall provision of undergraduate courses. So I'll hand back to Martin now. That's great, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Richard. Our next question is for Gail at the University of Southampton. Gail, the question for you is, uh, what type of career support and job prospects are there right now? Fantastic question, Martin, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think looking for the careers uh, support and, and looking at what career support is available when you're researching universities is really, really important. I think sometimes students feel that it's something that they'll worry about when they're a student, when they're a little bit further into their studies, maybe even wait till the final year. But a really good career service can support you from the moment you start university and support you all the way through your studies and also beyond graduation as well. So I think it's really, really important that when you're researching universities, you do really look at the type of career support that they are able to offer you. And I think you can probably be reassured that um, no matter which Russell Group University you choose, should you choose a Russell Group University, that you will have access to a really um, fantastic career service um, with lots of wonderful resources and support that you can draw upon, as I said, not just in those final, um, in that final year or few months, um, but also throughout your studies. Um, <clears throat> Catherine mentioned earlier on that um, as a Russell Group, uh, as a student at a Russell Group University, you are already really, really employable. So employers love students at Russell Group Universities. They feel that they've got lots of wonderful skills and knowledge 
that makes them really employable and they actively seek them out. So you'll find at careers fairs, which all universities will hold um, every year on campus um, or virtually, that they will attract top employers. And by top employers, I'm talking about companies like PwC, Microsoft, John Lewis, Deloitte, Rolls-Royce, Airbus, the NHS, and the list goes on. But all these top employers will have links to Russell Group universities and actively seek out their students. And uh, as I said, they will come onto campus um, and attend fairs um, where they will talk to students and make them aware of all the opportunities that they've got and the support they could offer should they seek a position in those companies. And that's something that we're very proud of as Russell Group Universities is those links to employers because they do so much, they create so many fantastic opportunities for all of our students. So do check out what, um, <clears throat> what links there are at the universities you're, uh, you're interested in. Um, in terms of the career service itself, um, I suspect many of our services are pretty similar. Um, it may be that they're called slightly different things at different institutions, um, but a typical service would offer uh, things like a drop-in service or where you make an appointment to see a careers advisor on a one-to-one -one basis. And as I've already said, that doesn't have to be as you're nearing the end of your course, you can make use of this service <clears throat> from day one if you wish to, and they can help you with all sorts of things. So it could be um, looking at um, career options if you're not sure at the moment what might be open to you. Um, it may be that you already know what you want to do, and in which case that's, that's fantastic and you've probably got a good idea of, um, <clears throat> of the path ahead of you. <clears throat> but for many people, they're absolutely passionate about their, their subject, about their degree, but not quite sure where it might go afterwards. And um, a chat with somebody in the career service might be able to help you unpick that a little bit, look at all the skills that you're developing as you're going through your course, um, what your strengths are, and just help you to maybe find out a little bit more, explore some of the options uh, as to what might be available to you. And also, talk to you about what previous graduates from the course that you're doing might have gone on to do as well. They can also help with um, feedback on a CV or a covering letter. They might be able to help you and um, prepare for an interview that you've got coming up, or maybe you've been invited to an assessment centre and not quite sure how to manage that. They will be able to help guide you through that process. They can also help you find internships and other placement opportunities if that's of interest to you and also advise on further study. So if you think that you might want to go on after you uh, complete your undergraduate course and do some form of postgraduate course, then they are there to help you explore all the options that are there available um, that are available to you. Now, I mentioned internships. Um, a little while ago, and these are really worth checking out. Now, most universities will offer internships to some degree, but I can assure you that should you choose to study at a Russell Group institution, the choice of internships is likely to be much, much greater. And that's going back to what I previously said about the, um, the networks with employers that Russell Group universities have and the extent of those networks and the relationships that they've got with lots of big name companies. And that opens the doors to lots more opportunities and lots more things like internships um, for you as students. And it doesn't matter if you know what you want to do um, or you don't know what you want to do. An internship is a great way of exploring lots of different possibilities. Um, learning new skills, building your professional network, and also getting paid as well. So really good, um, really good opportunities to help prepare you for the world of work um, in an internship. So something to look out for there. Something that we offer at Southampton, and again, it may well be something that's offered at other Russell Group universities, but perhaps under a slightly different name, is something called um, student innovation projects. And they these are designed to help you gain valuable experience by working on a real world business issue with students from other disciplines. So this is taking you away from your usual peer group 
and getting you to work with students from other courses together with a business or a nonprofit organization to create an innovative solution to a real world problem. And that can be a fantastic experience for you as a student, because it can help you to build your own awareness of business problems. What sorts of things are businesses trying to solve um, at the moment? It can help you to build your professional network, which might help you when you later graduate. It can help you to develop some key skills such as confidence, problem solving, critical thinking, commercial awareness, all those skills that employers are really looking for in their graduates and help boost your CV. We also run something called the Innovation Challenge, which is very similar to the Innovation Project, but it's much more um, intensive. So rather than a longer project, it's a four day intensive project working with a top employer to solve a problem with prizes and everything at the end of that. So much more competitive. Now, a lot of courses will already have a built in placement to them. So if you're doing a language course, for example, you can expect to spend a year abroad. Um, but there are lots of courses that don't. And at Southampton, we have something called the year in employment. So if your course doesn't already have a placement built into it, you can opt to extend your degree by a year should you wish to, and actually take a year, of, year in employment. And again, that can really help prepare you um, after graduation for the world of work um, by, again, building your professional network, increasing your skills and your knowledge and you're getting some valuable industry experience under your belt. Another thing the career service can also help you with is finding part time or casual work as a student while you study. So you're probably going to either want or need to earn some extra money while you're at university and the university job shop can help you find um, or help you access lots of opportunities. It can also help you with volunteering opportunities if that's your thing. Remember, volunteering can be just as valuable on your CV, if not more so sometimes, than actually paid experience. So do seek out what volunteering opportunities there might be. Um, again, helping you to develop those valuable transferable skills that employers really seek out. Things like leadership, team working, organisational skills, helping you to create a social impact as well in your community build networks, and of course, develop a positive impression for yourself as well um, for future employers, because as I said, they do like a bit of volunteering. We also have a student enterprise team, um, which supports students develop their enterprising and entrepreneurial skills. Again, these are skills that are highly valued by employers. Um, and that could be either through a one-to-one -one appointment with somebody in the team, or it could be taking advantage of the many opportunities that are there as part of our Future Worlds program, which is an on-campus on startup accelerator um, support. So if you've got an idea for a business and you want a little bit of support in terms of how to make that actually happen, then we can help guide you through that process and provide the support you need to, to realize that. There are also career mentoring schemes as well. Um, again, they may just exist under slightly different names in different universities. Um, they could be in person or they can be online. So e-mentoring, which is quite common as well now. And that's where you, you get matched up with somebody who can provide some more support for you in terms of just general career planning or maybe a bit more tailored support if you know what it is that you want to go into but maybe lack a bit of confidence or not quite sure where to access certain information or gain certain skills. So all in all, there's lots and lots of ways that a really good career service can help support you throughout your studies, not just at the end, but from day one, right through to when you graduate and also beyond as well. So at Southampton, uh, graduates can access our career service and all the resources and everything for five years after graduation and I know a lot of other universities have a similar approach as well um, so yeah do look at what what the career service at the universities you're interested in are offering you 
um, things like internships and um, other opportunities to help you gain those all important employer in, um, transferable skills that employers really love. And I'm going to hand back to Martin now. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Gail. Our next question is for Sarah at the University of Warwick. Sarah, how important are the facilities at universities and what should I be looking for? Brilliant. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, this is a great question. How important are the facilities at a university and what should you be looking for? Um, I think the first thing for me to say here is it's, it's really important that you're a little bit reflective in this. What's important to you, especially if you're going to a university that is not local and you're going to be living at that university, you might want to think about the things that make you happy in your life and then look to the university. Does it provide those facilities that will enable you to be happy? So, for example, if swimming is your thing, does the university have a swimming pool that you have access to or that or if it doesn't is there one locally close by these are kind of personal things personal facilities that that will be interesting to you and that will make you kind of happy and and fulfilled but I think wherever you're you're kind of watching this from and whatever your interests are there's going to be facilities that you're probably all going to be interested in so things like um, accommodation okay so different universities have different types of facilities um, for accommodation, some will have catered accommodation only, some will have self-catered accommodation only, some will have accommodation that is brand new and has three-quarter beds with ensuite bathrooms, others will have kind of standard accommodation where you might have to share bathrooms. Um, and even if you're um, a commuter student and you're going to be living at home and going to university, rather than the accommodation where you're going to live, you might want to think about what facilities does that university have for commuter students? Is there microwaves for you to kind of heat up your lunch if you're going to be on campus at lunchtime? Or is there space that you can go to socialise with other students in between your lectures? So there's accommodation kind of facilities that you might want to think about, commuter facilities that you want to think about. And aside from that, I would probably kind of split facilities into your learning facilities and into your living facilities. And what I would definitely recommend is that you come along to the fair on the kind of 29th of September and you can have a look at all of the different universities in the Russell Group. We've all got kind of videos and campus tours, as well as people like myself and, and reps from all the other universities who can talk to you about specific facilities at our individual universities. But I guess when we talk about learning facilities, it's things like the libraries. Do we have just one central library or is there multiple libraries? Is there different collections for different departments? Um, do they have access to online collections as well as physical um, books for you to read? And um, you might also want to think about labs now or laboratories. And, and many students think this is only going to apply if you're doing like a science degree. And, and yes, you will want to look at the facilities if you're doing a science degree. What are those labs like? Do they have specialist labs for different elements of science or different elements of engineering? Do they have the right technical equipment within them? What, what extensive, um, what amount of technical equipment do they have? For example, you know, at Warwick, our civil engineers, for example, have a, let me get this right, a strong foot machine which allows them to measure the um, or determine properties um, of structures for example or our engineering labs have a gate analysis um, machines so you might want to look into specialist facilities um, for your subject area but this even applies to art subjects as well and um, so do they have if you're interested in an art subject is there studios is there performance rooms is there editing suites is there rehearsal space do you have media labs so think about your kind of course and the needs for your course and then think about whether the university has the facilities to enable you to do that and one of the great things about Russell Group universities is we do so much research within our institutions that we have these incredible facilities that enable that research to take place and our students are often able to access and use and, and learn on those facilities as well. 
Um, I certainly know, you know, at, at Warwick, we've been investing quite heavily in our arts facilities as well. So if you're interested in the STEM subjects, there's lots of um, facilities on university campuses, but actually even with art subjects, there's a lot of investment going into that, that side of things. I mean, we've just got a new 57 million pound building opening on our campus for the Faculty of Arts. And it has all of those kind of um, spaces, multi-use exhibition spaces. We've got an antiquities room. We've got creative writing suites. There's um, various different computer labs that enable you to do different things. Um, so there's those learning facilities that, that Russell Group universities have, and, and many other universities will have um, equi um, brilliant facilities as well. But then you're also wanting to think about the fact that you might be living at university, or if you're commuting to university, you might want to be socialising on a university campus or in that university area. So you're going to want to think about the accommodation, as I mentioned earlier, but also those clubs and societies. What, how many clubs and societies are that are at that university? Do they have clubs and societies that you are interested in? For example, you know, at Warwick, we've got everything from football, rugby, hockey, um, sports clubs, right the way through to completely and societies like the cheese and chocolate society so there's something for everyone depending on interest and that's something that you might want to have a look at before you go to university and um, is it somewhere that you're going to feel like there's something on offer for you and um, if you're a musician you might want to have a look at whether universities have performance rooms do you have to book those how do you book those you can kind of look into the detail of that and um, you might also want to think about other facilities in the art so you know is there opportunity for you to go and watch performances how you know do you do you have facilities for um not just taking part in arts and theatre but actually kind of watching professional performers for example or professional musicians and and do productions you will also find that universities have students from all across the world from huge number of different countries and cultures and backgrounds and faiths and religions and, and many universities will have or all universities will have faith facilities as well to enable students from across the world to practice their faiths and, and, and what's right for their cultures and some universities have multi-faith centers and others will have specific facilities available for different um, groups so if that's important to you it's something you might want to consider researching when you're looking at which university is right for you um, and then aside from that you know for me it's incredibly important to think about where am I going to eat and where am I going to drink and where am I going to socialize so you might want to have a look and, and research a number of catering outlets available and whether or not they do discounts for students and you know are there places for you to kind of party or if you're not a party person and you don't drink are there places that you can go and socialize that are away from bars and and universities will have all of these different facilities to cater for all sorts of different students Students. So I think what I would say is, is have a look at the facilities and, and be aware of facilities that exist for things that you don't even know about yet. So again, at Warwick, we've just opened our esports centre. We have an incredible esports so, um, society and club at the university. So if you're interested in per competitive gaming, esports is your thing. Um, and I think one of our speakers earlier mentioned about innovation and, and getting um, on board with career development and, and looking at the careers facilities as well. But we've heard quite a lot about that. So, yeah, you, universities across the UK have a huge amount of facilities to enable you to live, learn and, and socialise and make friends with other students at your universities from within the UK and from all across the world so something for you to come and ask us about at the fair on Wednesday the 29th. I think that's enough from me so I'll hand back over to Martin who will then introduce I think our final speaker of the, this evening so Martin over to you. That's great thanks a lot Sarah. Yes our final speaker from the first round of questions that we've got is Emma from the University of York. Uh, Emma my question to you uh, can you give me some practical tips on where to start or how to narrow down my options? Of course, well, thank you. Um, so I'm Emma McShane from the University of York. Um, so some practical tips. I'm gonna follow on from what Glenn said um, uh, about research and kind of delve into a bit more about where to start. So if anything you get from me today would be to research, research and research again. It's really apt coming from research intensive universities in the Russell Group that we're asking you to do research, but that is what we like. So um, 
the Russell Group and um, the group of Russell Group universities um, were fantastic um, universities, but we all bring something different to the table and we all have a shared passion for and a shared ethos for excellence in teaching and research. But we also have different parts of us that, you know, that might be interesting to you and different kind of specialisms and things. So it really is important to research all your options. Um, where to begin, that's, <laughs> that's narrowing down, where to begin would probably be a handy um, advice for you. So I would say to start with your course of interest. So what is the course that interests you the most? This could be a particular subject area, um, it might be a follow on from a subject that you're currently studying um, in sixth form or in college or um, and you want to kind of continue that on. So, for example, if you study um, politics, you might want to go on to do politics as a degree. Um, but it might just be a subject area that you're interested in and you're not quite sure about the the particular course and degree, you might want to focus in and hone in on a, um, a specialism rather than a broader subject like politics. So. If that was your, um, if you want to kind of delve and research into what the university offers, um, at York we do things like global development or post-war reconstruction and development or international relations, and that is related to um, the politics area, but not quite a politics degree, a bit more of a focused degree. You can do a single subject um, at um, university, so just one um, one subject area, or you can do a joint honours or a mix of subjects, um, three or more um, subjects in a degree. A natural one of these would be PPE, politics, philosophy and economics. Um, if you have an idea of a career path, well, that will re be really clear to you what you um, kind of want to go on to do. Um, so, for example, medicine and law, we know exactly how you can get there and um, what will happen after that. But um, not everybody always knows at this stage of their life what they want to be when they're older. Um, I'm not quite there either yet. Um, so um, it, there is other courses that we provide at Russell Group Universities that would, would provide you with, with what we call transferable skills. Believe it or not, many moons ago when I went to do my degree, I um, wanted to be the next Quentin Tarantino and I did a degree in film and television production. It turns out I wasn't the next Tarantino, but my degree gave me a lot of transferable skills that um, transcend beyond the film industry or the TV industry. And it meant that now I work in the higher education sector and really enjoy my time here. But these are skills that I gained from my degree program. Um, I would really, really urge you to think um, of the courses that you're interested in on a modular level. So what are your own interests in that particular subject area? And what is the university offering? Quite often universities will provide courses with a similar name but they can be very different university to university. An example of this is um, history. History is offered in the UK um, across 85 institutions and every university that offers that will do it just a bit differently. Um, at the University of York we do from the fall of the Roman Empire onwards so if you were interested in Egyptology it might not be the program for you. Um, you might want to find somewhere um, that would that focuses in on them particular module areas um, and think what connections that the program has with other um, external kind of um, parties so um, for example our history students and our English literature students have access to the York Minster libraries so it means that as these kind of historians you can go to the Minster libraries and access these ancient books and use these books to reference your work and um, what other facilities at the university do they have to help you with your kind of education and that are really and also with your interests so at the University of York within our library we have the Boswick Institute which is the largest archive outside the city of London so it means that our students young historians can kind of go and access these amazing um, kind of archive facilities you could see the birth and death certificates of Guy Fox for example so it's really it's the things that are connected to your program as well um, and really think about your own interests um, in order for you to kind of determine if that's the, the area for you. As Tim has highlighted before, the universities, um, the Russell Group universities are research intensive. So um, 
our academics are key players in their field and they're super, super passionate about what they do. And this tends to be why the, how the courses are developed and it's reflected in how the courses are developed and made up. So it's particular, it kind of is informed by research. And because of this, um, we really, really love passionate students. And when you reflect that in your personal statement that you're passionate about a subject area, our admissions tutors will pick that up and really get that idea from you because you've done that research, you know what the, the and you can kind of talk about your own interests and in areas and um, in areas. So another thing to think about is where the university is located. Um, so would you like to stay close to home or move to a brand new area and try something new? Um, what are the transport links like to your home city? Um, what size is the university? So we have universities in the UK um, ranging from really small to quite big. Um, so a few thousand students right through to 50,000 students. Um, is it a campus-based university or city-based university? Um, and also, always check out the place that it is so um, a place that it's located so the city surrounding city as well and that'll really help you get an idea and a feel for um, where you're going to be living for three years of your life if you choose to live on campus um, or live close to the university. Um, what do they offer outside your course? We've spoke a lot about this, so things like study abroad, careers, all of these kind of pastoral care, mental health facilities, like all of these things you really have to think about in your employability after you leave. But is this in, um, in connection with your course as well? So some Russell Group universities, well, a lot of us will do um, 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 options to do a year in industry with a part of your course so for example if you study law at York and you're interested in international law you get an opportunity to study in Singapore and um, um, for a year and kind of experience international law in Singapore so there's loads and loads of things if you actually delve in and research that you'll be able to um, think and um, get involved with. Don't forget about student life this is a really important part of the university experience um, and it's a great way to network and develop yourself as well. So um, each university has a student union that is run by students for students and there's loads of opportunities to get involved, even if you're not particularly um, um, confident with getting yourself out there and meeting new people, there's kind of uh, there's ways of you kind of meeting and um, meeting new friends and networking with people through your student union, even if it's not something that's comfortable to you. University is a completely transformative experience. It's important to think about all elements of university life and this includes student life as well. And as we said before, the, um, the only way to kind of really experience a university is to attend FERS, um, like what's happening next week and speak to the, um, our colleagues, try and visit if we can in the next year via open days, but you can also do, um, universities have come up with really kind of innovative ways of um, doing open days online and connecting with, um, with you. So if it is an online open day, there's really um, good resources on there to, and opportunities to speak to academics from programs, students who currently study them, um, and things like admissions teams and stuff and talk about um, the application process and then finally my last tip would be after you research all your options chat with um, the key people in your life people like teachers family friends this is a massive decision and a big decision it's important to talk through all your options and make sure that you've done um, you chat through your research with trusted people um, in order to come up with um, the right place for you hope that helped. That's fantastic. Yes, it was incredibly helpful, Emma. And, and that's the first round of uh, questions that we've gone through. I hope for a lot of you, it's very, very informative and you've learned a lot from it. We, we do have a couple uh, of extra rounds of questions I'm hoping to go through. It's just going to be a little bit time dependent, but um, I, I would say for our speakers in many instances, if we can try and push through the answers as quick as possible, that'd be great, whilst not cutting out any important information, which I know uh, obviously is a little bit of a difficult task. Um, and I will quickly mention, I put something in the chat earlier on, um, and it was mentioned by Sarah Warwick a little bit earlier. Obviously, the, this is talk number two, 
uh, of three warm-up webinars leading up to the Meet the Russell Group virtual fair, which is running next Wednesday on the 29th of September. That event will run from 12 o'clock until 7 o'clock. There are a lot of fantastic opportunities to visit lots of booths of all 24 Russell Group institutions. You can view live webinars, um, pre-recorded videos, go through campus tours, and a lot of other functions, as well as obviously speaking in text to a lot of um, representatives from the different uh, universities as well. I've got to say some of the questions coming through the Q&A have been excellent. So please do keep those coming through and the, the team here are obviously going to be happy to answer as many as they can. So I'm going to go back round um, to the beginning. And as mentioned right at the start, we do have uh, our special guest uh, today, which is the chief executive of the Russell Group, Dr. Tim Bradshaw. And my next question is going to be directed to him. So Tim, my question to you, and it's a good one, certainly given the times that we're in at the moment, is it actually worth going to university at the moment? Aren't universities keeping online learning, even though the pandemic is over? Uh, Martin, thank you. Yeah, that's, that is an excellent question. Um, look, my response to that would be, you know, doesn't matter what's happening in the world and whatever time zone you're in, um, getting the best education you can is probably the best advice you can give to anybody, um, you know, in terms of whatever the future holds, the best education that you can get is going to stand you in, in good stead for that future. Uh, and if you want to look at sort of how that sort of panned out in the past, and you can see the sort of statistics on, on Russell Group universities, our graduates have a much higher percentage go into professional employment, uh, into careers uh, with really good earning potential. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies, for example, did a, uh, an analysis looking at our universities versus all the others in the UK, and they could show that even when you factored in things like uh, previous learning experience, uh, family background and history, whether other students have been to university or not um, in the family previously, they still found that um, students who came through Russell Group universities on the whole earned something like 10% more than students who went to other universities. So I would say, yes, absolutely, it really is worthwhile going to university. And if you've got the right skills and the attitude and you really want to, engage with, as my colleagues have said, sort of the research-led learning environment you find at university uh, in the Russell Group, then this is the place for you. Um, I think be, you'll have a fantastic opportunity there. That, then you said, is, is, it all, is it all online? No, it's not um, all online. And let me just sort of dispel the myths that are going around in various newspaper circles at the moment. Um, when you come to Russell Group University, uh, the students who are joining us this, this term, but also when you, if you join us uh, next year, uh, you will find that the majority of the teaching and learning is being done in person. So tutorials, seminars, practical sessions, field work, and all those sorts of things. Um, but we are doing some digital learning, and we are doing that uh, very specifically to enhance the teaching and learning experience that students have. And, you know, there, there was a model of teaching and learning in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, which was all about putting students into large lecture halls and, and a single individual standing up and sort of preaching to them, lecturing to them from the front. But if you've got sort of 400 students in a room, that's not very interactive. And I think we can do better than that. And I think that's what my universities are doing. They're looking at how to use the best in modern technology to really enhance that teaching and learning experience and do things differently. So what you might find is some of the very largest lectures that you would have done uh, might now be done in different ways. It might be done in smaller groups. Some of it might be done online and little elements of it. Um, but it's all done to enhance the teaching and learning experience. And let me just give you sort of three examples of how that would work. So there's things like flipped lectures. Um, so in the past, you would go to a lecture and then do lots of follow up activities, which might be you know, required to do research and things online anyway. And what we're trying to do in many cases is to flip that round and give students uh, packages of material that they can engage with to start off with. They might be short video clips, it might be bits of online lectures and things like that to really sort of get them into the subject so that when they actually come into the more in person uh, environment, they can really engage and interact. In, in, and, get, and get the best out of that teaching experience with the, with the lecturers and tutors. Uh, the second way is to make sure that you get the, the best experience when you're doing things like lab and field work. So I, I did geology as a, as, a, as a degree, and I, and I do remember vividly, you tend to waste sort of half your time on the first day or so getting to grips with equipment and actually being a geologist in the field, and it, it is difficult. Um, 
but various of our universities have, have, have created packages of digital materials and sort of VR simulations that students can engage with, get to grips with some of the field techniques or get to grips with using lab equipment and practicing trying out experiments before you then go hands on into the lab or into the field. So again, you get the most out of the, the in-person face-to-face uh, learning experience. And then thirdly, there's a sort of a, a, a real thing about digital collaboration. Um, and I think uh, it was Gail at Southampton, I think, who mentioned one of the things that we do, sort of e-mentoring of students. So being able to bring students together with uh, mentors who, who might not actually be on campus, they might be in business or elsewhere to help them with their career choices. Or it might be things um, like uh, sort of showcasing engineering projects. You know, one of our universities does that and students work together virtually on engineering projects through the year. Or one of my favourite ones was actually at Warwick University, where they've created a digital patient uh, so that medical students there can engage with um, a sort of a virtual patient throughout the year in the same way that a GP would do, because a GP would only see a patient intermittently and, and, and then you have sort of big gaps in time when you might not know what's going on. And so the medical students there are using digital technologies to tap into sort of a, a, a patient's history, a series of virtual histories, uh, what their blood tests or other results might have been and then they sort of predict what they what they might need to do next and how they would engage with that patient in real life were they then to meet them so some really really exciting hands-on digital learning things uh, in what we're calling a, a blended learning experience it will be absolutely majority in person uh, talk but there will be an awful lot of really good enhancements in that digital space that all of our universities are working on does that, does that answer your question martin yeah, yes, absolutely perfect. Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, our next question then uh, is for Catherine at the University of Birmingham. Catherine, what is the benefit of attending a Russell Group University over a non-Russell Group University who ranks higher in rankings? Have we got... Uh, have we got Catherine? I might move on then, uh, unless it's my reception potentially. Can everyone hear me okay? For a different, um, these can be scores from student satisfaction surveys. It can be the staff student ratio. It can be graduate outcomes. It could be how much they spend on a student and a whole host of other factors. So it's not really a clean cut way of looking at the quality of universities when you look at lead tables. You know, if it if it was that simple, every lead table, every university would be ranked exactly the same. And we're not. We, we have different um, rankings in different lead tables. So you almost have to look at actually what are they including in that lead table? And is that particular thing that's being measured going to impact on me? when I go to university or not. I still think though that the value of going to the Russell Group University is as we've said all along, you, you'll guarantee that you'll be taught by experts and you can guarantee that your the university will be targeted by graduate employers. And as you've heard, you're probably going to earn more as well if you've been to a, a Russell Group University. But I also think that it comes back to being a game. It's important to find a course that you're interested in on a on a, at a university that you absolutely love and kind of one of the best ways to do that is to be able to go and visit and see how it feels to you so I think my message is take lead tables with a bit of a pinch of salt um, and also at the end of the day um, you have to choose the right course at the right university for you I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that or whether that answers the question did anyone have anything they wanted to say or are we comfortable to move on? No, I think you've done obviously done a great job, Catherine. So we'll move on. Thank you very much. And apologies if I dropped out uh, a second ago. Our next question is for Rona at the University of Glasgow. Rona, how are Russell Group universities embracing the Turing scheme? What support is available for students from lower income backgrounds looking to study abroad? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so the Russell Group Universities, we have embraced um, a Turing programme and um, we're really committed to giving students the opportunity to study abroad as part of their degrees. 
International relations, um, as you've heard throughout this, uh, throughout this session, is really key to the Russell Group. Um, we're known for our work globally and we want to make a global impact uh, with our research and create all these wonderful links with institutions around the world. One of the ways that we do this is by sending students on exchange programmes. So the Turing Scheme um, is replacing the Erasmus European Exchange Programme. Um, so it's one way that we will spend time to send students abroad. Um, studying abroad is an absolutely fantastic um, part opportunity if you have it um, to have as part of your degree. Um, you can go off learn at a different university and um, in a different country in a different culture, make connections, make friends, um, maybe even experience some good weather. If you're coming from a country with perhaps not so great, great weather, um, it's, it's a really fantastic opportunity that Russell Group institutions are really um, keen to promote um, and to have embedded within our, within our systems. Um, it's the UK government um, is going to fund about 40,000 students um, to study or work abroad as part of this new scheme. Um, each university will have different partners um, and different places you can go. Um, so wherever you're thinking of studying, um, it's worth getting in touch and asking what the study abroad opportunities are. Um, you won't apply to study abroad until much later on. Um, so after you've started your university programme, that's when you'll get information about studying abroad. Um, so if you're watching the session today and are, are quite keen to study abroad or think you might be quite interested, Fantastic. Um, we don't need to know too much of that at the moment, um, but once you start at university, that's when the real sort of work to get your abroad will, will, will begin. Um, but if you have a look at the university's websites, they tell you, start to tell you all the different destinations and places that you can, you can go. Um, in terms of support for um, lower income students, um, so that part of the training programme is it hopes that 48 of percent of people that go abroad um, will be from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, so the way that this all will happen is there'll be additional support um, for students looking to go abroad. So this could be um, help with travel costs. Um, if you're going a little bit further away around the world, there could be additional support for, for travel. Um, things like visa costs, health insurance, all those sorts of things. Um, so to make it as easy as possible for students from a variety of different backgrounds to experience studying abroad. Um, but yeah, I would, I would encourage um, anybody listening today, if you are interested in studying abroad, a fantastic thing. Um, and ask, absolutely ask um, at the event at the at next week, and um, when you chat to, to all of us at our fair, um, ask about study abroad opportunities. Um, I would be happy to tell you um, some more information. Thanks, Martin. That's super, Rona. And yes, I love the mention about the event next week. It's obviously a fantastic opportunity to speak to um, Rona as well as many other reps from different universities from the Russell Group. Our next question then is for Glenn at the University of Bristol. Glenn, how does graduate employability compare for Russell Group universities and non-Russell Group universities? Um, this has been quite uh, well covered in bits along the way, actually, and I think um, Dr. Tim just mentioned that, um, you know, we don't have a, 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 a crystal ball, so we don't know quite how things are going to be going into the future, but it seems with the uncertainty that result both from Brexit and the pandemic, that the, um, the trends that we've seen in the last two years will continue, and among those trends, graduates on average earn about 10k a year more than non-graduates and as Dr Tim said on average graduates from Russell Group universities earn about 10% more than graduates from the average university. Um, the research and all kinds of um, information about this is available and um, you can get some very detailed response about graduate outcomes if you know the career you're heading towards. Um, in more general terms, um, some useful things to look at would be high flyers research, which, look, which looks at the universities that are most targeted by um, top employers. And we've mentioned before the kind of employers they are, they're city employers. And, and there's, there, you, you know, if you look high flyers, you can find out more about who they are. 19 of the top 20 universities targeted by them are in the Russell Group. Um, the 19 of the top 20 universities ranked highest for graduate employability as per the um, QS rankings are also in the Russell Group. But if you're not 100% sure uh, which career you're headed towards, um, it can get a bit difficult to know. And, and you know, one of the things that we've said a few times is, 
there's lots of things you can do that um, significantly increase both your earning potential, um, but also your chance of finding a job when you hit the labour market. And those things do include internships, placements, work experience. And we tend to be in uh, the Russell Group universities, we tend to be in a really good position to make sure those are really important and, and, and valuable experiences, often with the employers that you would want to be employed with later. Um, and then, yeah, it's really hard to, to know what you're going to want to do in 10, 20, 40 years time. We all know that there's nothing you can do to give yourself a better leg up than getting a good degree. Um, as Dr. Tim said, education is probably the best key that we have. And of all the most important factors in future success and earnings and wealth, it's probably the one you have most control over. So get stuck into your research now. Come along next Wednesday and, and interrogate us all and ask us all questions and um, try and find a course that you're going to love most because that's the thing that's going to have the biggest input into your future success and earning potential. That's superb. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Katie at the University of Manchester. The question, Katie, with a growing interest in degree apprenticeships, why should students go to university through the traditional route? Um, and the question may be, uh, opened up slightly more to the the whole panel um, is do any Russell Group universities offer an apprenticeship? Okay, great, thank you, Martin. I, I think the answer to this question is it, it does very much depend on the kind of experience you want to have as a student and what it is you're looking for. So. It may be that doing a degree apprenticeship really appeals to you because you really like the idea of doing something very specific, uh, gaining some work experience while you're studying, um, doing kind of having a very full timetable and, and kind of managing things in that way and knowing that it's going to, to lead to a very specific career afterwards. Um, so, I mean, first and foremost, really important to, to research and understand what that degree apprenticeship will involve because it's a huge time commitment um, and it's a very different experience to, to studying an undergraduate degree, as you say, through a more traditional route at a university. So I think um, in terms of kind of why you might want to think about doing a degree over a degree apprenticeship, think about that experience. So as an undergraduate student at, say, Russell Group University, um, you are, of course, very much more in charge of managing your own time and your own studies. Uh, there's a lot more flexibility in terms of what you do day to day, week to week. So yes, you've got your course commitments and you may have work placements, you may have time in the lab, you'll have seminars, tutorials, uh, but there will be time on top of that where you can engage in other things and experience different uh, opportunities. So for example, you might want to join a society at university. It's a great way to meet new people. We've already talked about some of those opportunities. You might want to or be interested in studying abroad, which you can do on, on some or you know, many different courses for a certain amount of time, have the opportunity to study and live abroad. Uh, you might also want to do some volunteering. Uh, you might want to live in halls of residence, uh, you know, become more independent, have that experience of moving away from home, uh, meeting new people. Of course, you're going to meet new people from all walks of life, from all over the world on an apprenticeship, but you are also definitely going to do that at a university, uh, particularly at a university uh, in a large city like a Russell Group one. So really thinking about what you want that experience to be. Uh, and bear in mind as well, if you are very interested in doing something vocational, there are lots of vocational courses at universities. So you might want to do medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, engineering, architecture, and they're all options available to you, which will help you to, um, to progress into a very specific career afterwards. And then finally, I just kind of really wanted to, to stress that um, there is work experience available as part of an undergraduate degree, depending on the one that you might want to progress to, uh, you can undertake work experience for many courses. So if that's something that's important to you, you may want to look at a course that involves a year in industry. In terms of the second part of that question, uh, which universities offer degree apprenticeships, at Manchester, we don't offer any at undergraduate level at the moment, but as Martin said, if I can just open that up to the group to see if anybody else does or if anybody would like to comment on on what they offer in that respect that would be great hi katie i just thought i'd add in terms of university apprentice or degree apprenticeships is often these are going to vary and they're going to become available at different times my um, young, I know this firsthand because my younger brother was in year 13 last year and has just secured a degree apprenticeship at Jaguar Land Rover. 
and um, degree apprenticeships are incredibly competitive. I think he applied for about 35 different apprenticeships um, and actually you apply to the organization and then if you are kind of get through the shortlisting and the interview stages with that organization, they'll also check whether you meet the core requirements for the academic side. And then they have a link with the learning provider. So many of our universities will have these relationships with certain providers. They may come on board at different times of the year. So I think earlier on in the chat, I did post a link to the .gov.uk um, degree apprenticeship search and I think you can find that on UCAS as well but yeah very very competitive and and they come up all times during the year so keep your eyes on um, the various search portals for those. Thank you Sarah I just I just thought of one other point sorry before I pass back to you Martin and that was that 60% of graduate jobs um, at the moment around about 60% are open up to graduates with a degree in any discipline so if, if people are thinking about kind of progression afterwards as well uh, it's not to say you would be limited if you were to choose a degree over a specific apprenticeship. That's perfect thanks a lot Katie and thanks uh, Sarah good teamwork on that question. Um, so we've got uh, a few questions left uh, for the remainder of the session. Our next one is back over to Richard at the University of Oxford. Richard, uh, how can you demonstrate you are the perfect fit for a university? For example, if I'm an avid rower and apply to Oxford, would the university look more favourably on my application due to the famous rowing club? Hi, thanks. A great question, I think, because it touches on lots of aspects, essentially, of extracurricular. I can be really brief, if not slightly direct on this. And essentially, in an application to Oxford, and um, this will apply across the Russell Group to differing extents, perhaps, whilst we think that extracurricular activities are fascinating for the individuals that apply to us and they're really important to you, particularly while you're at university as well, no, we do not really look at extracurricular information in a personal statement. So to be really frank, in a personal statement, um, I would suggest um not really mentioning much much extracurricular and uh yes if you're really into rowing that's that's great brilliant for you but it's not really going to make any difference to your application to the university of oxford um that's fairly direct back to you martin that's great thanks a lot richard uh over now um to gail at the university of southampton gail the question for you if I don't have the required A-level or GCSE, um, GCSE grades, what options are available to me? Do all Russell Group universities offer foundation courses? Thanks very much, Martin. Um, to be honest, I can't speak for the whole of the Russell Group, so um, it may be that uh, other people want to chip in, but I, I can tell you that from Southampton's point of view, yes, we do offer um, three uh, foundation courses. So if you find yourself in the boat that um, perhaps you haven't done the right A level, so maybe you, you're looking at a course where you need an engineering course, for example, where um, the requirement is for you to have done maths and physics, but actually you've only done one of those, um, or you're looking to change direction, um, then a foundation course would definitely be worth looking into. So um, re do your research, look at universities and see whether a foundation course is available to you in the area that you're looking to go into. So for example, um, we offer one in, in science at Southampton. So um, if you, as I said, if you decide to change direction then maybe you're looking at a course where you need to have done biology, but you haven't done biology, um, then have a look at the Science Foundation course and providing that you, um, you, you pass that, um, then that will guarantee you entry onto a number of different programmes. So there's up to 16 different programmes, undergraduate programmes that you could be eligible for entry onto um, if you pass the Science Foundation year. And that could be something like audiology. Um, perhaps you just weren't aware that a subject like that existed um, previously. Um, pharmacology, neuroscience, uh, chemistry, chemical engineering, environmental science, marine biology, oceanography, all these fantastic courses um, that you might have only just become aware, aware of, um, uh, but you haven't done the right uh, A-levels, then that might be the course for you. Um, there's also another one 
which is in engineering, physics, maths and geophysics. Um, and again, entry um, on uh, passing that course will guarantee you a place on a, uh, a number of different programs. So there's 17 different subject areas where you could get a place on an undergraduate program if you successfully complete the foundation year. And that will, um, the foundation year will give you an introduction in mathematics, in mechanics, computer programming, electronics, and the principles of engineering. Um, so that can be a, a, a great option. Again, if you find yourself in that situation where perhaps you haven't done quite the right subjects um, or you're just looking to change uh, direction there. And there's also an international foundation year uh, where students get support in terms of their uh, getting their English language up to um, the standard required as well. So they are the three main uh, foundation programmes that we offer at Southampton. But as I said, I can't speak for the rest of the uh, Russell group. So other people may want to chip in there, but I'm going to hand back to Martin. I will give it a couple of seconds to see if anyone does want to mention anything. If not, we'll move back to Sarah at the University of Warwick, which I think we'll do. Fantastic. Uh, OK, Sarah. Um, Question for you, uh, what are Russell Group Universities doing to widen participation? Yeah, thanks again, Martin. Um, I think this is a great question. And I think Katie actually spoke really, um, really well and, and perfectly about this earlier on. So I'll just maybe do a summary for those of you that kind of missed it. But I think universities are doing uh, a lot of things to ensure that they are open to students of all different um, educational experiences and kind of backgrounds and, and open their, their doors and become accessible. So things include um, contextual offers um, to ensure that applicants kind of uh, are approached on a level playing field, essentially. So we look at your context, your educational experience, this individual experience and perhaps that of your school um, and wider context. Um, we also run a number of access programmes to um, our universities. I know at Warwick, we have some access programmes where we actually start working with students in um, as young as year five and year six to kind of raise their awareness and, and aspirations more broadly. And then we work with students right the way through kind of secondary school and into sixth form and college as well, to not just to kind of make them aware of universities, but also to help raise attainment levels, provide mentors, um, to kind of so that you know students who perhaps have not had family who've gone through higher education have got kind of mentors and and people within that setting that they can talk to and ask for advice as well um, in addition to that I think Katie mentioned that there's various finance um, bursaries and scholarships available so that finance should never be a barrier to accessing university um, and also I think the there's um, various support networks for students once they actually arrive at our universities and um, so that's maybe not widening access but it is making sure that when students do arrive at university they feel safe supported um, and that, 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 that it's a place for them to, to belong um, along with all of our other students. So I think there's various things from um, financial support, mentoring support, general awareness and, and, and access um, programs that students can use, as well as those contextual offers, which are perhaps slightly reduced to, um, as I said, level that playing field. And um, so Katie said it much better than I did earlier on, but that's a little summary um, to kind of follow up. So Martin, back over to you. That's great. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So our final question of the second round, and then we're going to have one final question, uh, which will go through to Dr. Tim Bradshaw of the Russell Group. Um, but first, we're with uh, Emma at the University of York. The question, Emma, if students are unable to attend open days, how can students find out more about different universities? Hello. Um, hi. Um, so um, that's a really good question because um, we tend to not have, we tend to have a couple of, um, some universities will have up to four, maybe six open days a year, but it's not always easy to get there, especially if you're not local to a particular university or it's a bit further away from you or if it's in the school year. So um, there's many ways that you can um, reach out and get in contact and kind of visit a university. Universities will do ad hoc, um, outside the open days and other visit days, will do ad hoc, um, campus tours and um, if you look on our individual web pages there'll be um, a 
obviously can't speak for anybody else but we we tend to have campus tours that you can sign up and kind of have a look around the university we have other things like epq events like epq conferences um um that you could sign up for that which focuses on um kind of provision of epq but also you'll get to see a bit of the university outside of that um in march time and as far as I know so far, hopefully um, it will go ahead next March. Um, we have UCAS conventions. So they tend to happen in March right through to June. And these are in the big major cities throughout the UK. So um, this is a collection of not just Russell Group universities, but a lot of universities throughout the UK will, um, will, um, will attend these, will be at these, um, uh, UCAS fairs that you can kind of come and collect a prospectus and talk to um, students and more so coming up quite soon actually we have the UK uni search events so these are happening throughout um, the months of October and November and these are also in major cities throughout the UK so if you want to a bit sooner if you can't make any of the open days or you haven't been able to make any of the summer open days um, um, please look at the UK uni search um, conventions um, I know there's some happening in London um, next week um, we have um, there's Newcastle there's Sheffield um, Martin Bill will be able to talk a bit more better about this than I would um, but these are uh, big conventions happening um, in different locations throughout the UK where you can come and speak to staff um, about um, the university and also the event next week and um, the virtual event but in a physical sense you can come and visit us at these conventions so UK Uni Search UCAS or other kind of campus tours and small bespoke um, sessions through the university I really hope that helps because that was a bit of a ramble <laughs> apologies <laughs> no that's absolutely fine thank you very much Emma and yes as Emma mentioned we've got some events running ourselves fairly shortly uh, across a number of cities uh, one of which is uh, London on Friday. I'm just posting the website for UK University Search. So if you're interested in coming along to any of the events, you can go on there and you can find a little bit more information. Right. Um, so our final question of the day, we're actually going back round, as I mentioned, to Dr. Tim Bradshaw, um, Chief Executive of the Russell Group. And I think it's a really, really good question and one that um, I'm sure you could be very, very interested to find the answer for. So um, Dr. Bradshaw, the question to you, What's the biggest advice you would give your 17 year old self? <laughs> oh, great. Thanks, Martin. Um, look, before I answer that, can I just say uh, thank you very much to everybody who's contributed today. It's been, some, it's been fascinating seeing the insights into what's going on at my member universities. And, I, and I, my takeaways from this have been, and I've written this down, exciting, interesting, intellectually challenging, and very, very supportive in terms of what you will find across the Russell Group. But heavens, what would I tell my 17 year old self? I think I think the key advice would be to not only do the academic work, but to get really stuck into all of the wider opportunities that are available at university. I, I'm sure I missed out on some and I'm sure that there are some fantastic extracurricular things that I could have done, different clubs, societies, learning new things in, from a different perspective. I think that's one thing that uh, you know it's, it is a bit challenging and scary, perhaps going to university and finding yourself in a in a, in a place with lots and lots of new people who you don't know, um, and you may sort of fall back into doing the academic thing because that's the thing that you know you're good at. But I would really, really urge you to sort of get out of your comfort zone a little bit and try something new whilst you're at university too. So really, really find out what's going on at the freshers' fairs when they happen in the sort of your first couple of weeks when you're at uni. And, and do something different, do something you've never done before, learn a new skill, meet some new friends uh, and challenge yourself because that will really set you up for the future. Thanks, Martin. That's fantastic and a really, really good way to sign us off for the session as well. And thank you so much to everyone who's joined us today. There's been some fantastic questions coming through in the q and I do hope that we've been able to answer a majority of those. Uh, I know that some of the team are still typing away at some of the questions that are coming through. So I will leave the session open maybe for about five minutes after we sign off to make sure that those are all finished. But as I say, thank you for joining us. This was, as mentioned before, session two. Uh, of three warm-up webinars uh, before the virtual event, the Meet the Russell Group virtual event, 
which is running on the 29th of September, so that's next Wednesday. I posted a few links um, for both the Zoom webinar next Monday, uh, which you can sign up for, which will be between 4.30 and 6 p.m., as well as the virtual fair, obviously running next Wednesday. Um, it only really goes uh, now for me to thank uh, the uh, panelists that have joined us today. Obviously, we've covered um, Dr. Uh, Tim Bradshaw, Chief Executive of the Russell Group. For, uh, excellent to have him along for the session. We've also had Catherine from the University of Birmingham, Rona from the University of Glasgow, Glenn from the University of Bristol, Katie from the University of Manchester, Richard from the University of Oxford, Gail from the University of Southampton, Sarah from the University of Warwick, and Emma from the University of York. So uh, on their behalf, as well as mine, thanks again for joining us. I do hope you'll join us next Monday once again, uh, as well as the Meet the Russell Group event um, next Wednesday. So have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much.